Due Process, winner of 19 regional Emmy Awards, including the 2010 New York Emmy for our coverage of voting rights, and the 2011 Mid-Atlantic Emmy for outstanding discussion series. Due Process is a presentation of Rutgers School of Law Newark and the Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. Studio facilities provided by the Rutgers ITV Studio, Division of Continuing Studies. One of the things that's going to be interesting about this is I think it is going to inject the Supreme Court into the presidential campaign in a way that the Supreme Court has not been a political issue for a very long time. Uh, this decision is going to come just as the presidential campaign is heating up and it's going to be a source of debate uh, no matter what the court does. Supreme Court expert Steve Shapiro on the potentially explosive health care case. As national legal director of the American Civil Liberties Union, he's argued before the high court dozens of times. But he's also the most incisive court observer we know. And that's why, at this critical time on the court, he's our only guest on this special Supreme Court edition of Due Process. Major funding for Due Process provided by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy. Welcome to Due Process. If you're watching us, chances are you are also among those watching the pageant that plays out each spring in D.C. The Supreme Court's end of term, the last of the arguments heard, decision-making in full swing, the most critical rulings handed down. This year that means we all await word on the future of American health care, the legitimacy of Arizona's answer to fighting the flow of illegals, even the indecency standard for broadcast TV. And as always at this time of year, we turn to the best court observer we know, Steve Shapiro, legal director for the National ACLU. Steve, welcome back to Due Process. And where else to start but with health care? What's on the line here? Well, I think the, the fate of the Obama administration, President Obama's signature legislative achievement is on the line. Uh, the future of health care in America is on the line, how our health care industry is going to be uh, structured. This is probably the highest profile case that the Supreme Court has had since Bush v. Gore and there were uh, a three, decade ago. Three electrifying days of um, um, Only if you're a junkie, Sandy. Uh, yeah, if, if you're a junkie for this kind of stuff, um, of arguments right. and of questions, and some of those questions may have been surprising, but before we get to what they did or didn't mm -hmm. signal, we're not talking about the entire health care bill being lost here. Well, we're not talking about the entire health care bill being challenged. Uh, we're talking principally about one key provision of the health care bill, which requires everybody to either purchase health insurance or pay a penalty if they do not purchase health insurance. That's where, you know, all the legal and political firepower has gone. Rather like the Massachusetts law that exactly. Romney brought in as governor. Exactly like the Massachusetts law. So one of the things that's important, I think, for people to understand and that often gets lost in the discussion is this is not a question of whether the government can require you to buy health insurance if New Jersey, like Massachusetts, were to decide tomorrow that it wanted all of its citizens to purchase health insurance, it could do so. It's only a question of whether the federal government has the right to do so because, because, of, because the federal government is a government of limited powers and it only has the powers that are granted to it under the Constitution. The broader powers to govern all of us belong to the states, right? So we hear the Commerce Clause talk about. So the question is, does this fit within one of the powers that the Constitution grants to the federal government and the principal 
uh, power that is sort of at issue in this case is the Commerce Clause. And the Commerce Clause says we are national, um, uh, we have a national government, we have a national economy, and therefore the federal government is the appropriate body of government uh, to regulate interstate commerce. Commerce that affects more than one state affects the entire country. And the question then became, does this health care law and does this provision in particular affect interstate commerce? Uh, and I think many people who watch the court, myself included, but people both on the liberal side of this debate and the conservative side of this debate thought that whatever the wisdom of this individual mandate may have been, whatever political problems there may have been in getting it enacted legally, um, it was not that difficult a question and that the power of the federal government to do what it had done in this case was pretty clearly established uh, by the Supreme Court's past cases. But um, it turned out to be a much closer case than anybody expected. I just wanted to add one thing, though, in response to the, the, your initial question, which is even though the fight is primarily about this part mandate. of the health care, the mandate, right, um, there is an issue that if the mandate goes down, what goes down with it? Uh, does only the mandate go down? Do some provisions closely tied to the mandate goes down, but the rest survives? Or does the entire health care bill go down? Does the Obama administration say you've pulled this out? Well, then we were going to pull this, this, and this out and, and let it... Um, let it just go to hell and the, Obama, the, the that, Obama administration what do they have to lose the Obama administration does something that I think is you know legally plausible but politically um, very appealing to them and they say there are three provisions of this health care bill that are connected at the hip right one is a provision that says insurers cannot deny insurance to people based upon pre-existing health conditions. And that was one from the insurers by guaranteeing the mandate. It, well, here's the way it goes, right? So insurance companies cannot deny anybody insurance based on a pre-existing health condition. They also cannot charge you under this law a higher premium based on your past health history. Both of those provisions, unchallenged in this case, are very politically popular. People like those provisions, right? But both of those provisions make business more expensive for the insurance companies. And so the way to offset that expense is to bring more people into the insurance pool. And the way you bring more people into the insurance pool is by requiring everybody to buy insurance. So the Obama administration goes to the Supreme Court and says, if you strike down the mandate, then there is no money to pay for these other two provisions, and they have to fall as well, which, among other things, raises the political cost to the Supreme Court of taking that move because it's going, the mandate is not popular, these other provisions are. So Obama is trying to connect the unpopular provision to two very popular provisions and make the Supreme Court's decision much more difficult for them. Would he actually, do you think, pull the plug he, on it's not the up, most popular parts of this if it goes down? It, it's not up to him. It's up to the court. But the, once the court says... No, 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 no. The court in this case will say, it could say everything's on, everything is fine, right? We, but if it says the mandate the requirement that you buy insurance right. is unconstitutional, then the court has to decide, not the Obama administration, the court has to decide what else falls with that, if anything. Right. So the Obama administration would not have the ability to take that off the no, table? No, no, because whatever... Only the threat in the arguments. Right, that if you strike down the mandate and you want to be faithful to what Congress had in mind you have to strike down these other provisions as well. Right? Okay, so where does all of this win an election year? Right. So right. where does all of this take us? Well, I think, I think it's going to dominate the headlines. I mean, this is, for all intents and purposes, going to be the only issue people are discussing for, for you know, a week or two, if, if not longer. And I think that the decision, uh, several things are going to happen. I think the decision, one way or the other, is going to galvanize the base of one party or the other. So if, if a key provision of the health care bill or more is struck down, I think what you're going to see is a lot of grassroots Democrats getting out and, and, and voting because they're going to be so upset by this that result. Conversely, 
if the health care bill is upheld as constitutional by the Supreme Court, then for those in the Republican Party who oppose health care, their only recourse is to Congress. And so it's going to galvanize them to get out and vote. I think the Obama administration has also floated some trial balloons um, to the effect of if the uh, law is struck down or its key provision is struck down, um, I think they are at least considering the possibility of running against the Supreme Court, making the Supreme Court an issue in the political in the political campaign in the way it was back in the old Warren court days, uh, but it hasn't really been so much since. So doesn't it get harder and harder, though, for um, Romney, whichever way this goes, to make it an issue when it was, after all, his model? Well, you know, I, I he seems to have... Um, uh, figured out a way, at least in his own mind, uh, to be on both sides of that fence. Um, and I think the way he says it is, he says, it's one thing if Massachusetts wants to do it, the, the, the state is is close to the people who live there, right? And the people in Massachusetts want to make that decision for themselves, they can do that. But the federal government ought not to impose it on all of us. And and I think he, if this is upheld by the Supreme Court, I think he's going to come out uh, swinging, uh, not at the Supreme Court, um, but I think his his political line then is going to be, this is why you need to elect me so that with a Republican Congress, I can repeal health care because the Supreme Court is which not I used going to, like, to save but us, I don't like any which I used to like, but I don't like anymore. Right? Okay, a lot of really responsible right. court watchers, including right. you, thought that this was pretty much a done deal. It mm -hmm. was not only going to win, but it could win by a larger margin than you had even hoped. And I heard you say that, and then three days of right. hearings came, and what do you say now? It's going to be a dogfight. Um, and it just shows Supreme Court cases are not law school exams. You know, as a law school exam, this was, I think, an easy case. Um, in the Supreme Court courtroom, it turned out not to be an easy case. And if I were surprised, I think the administration was even more surprised. I think they walked into a buzzsaw um, that they didn't quite anticipate. Now, all Justice Kennedy, again, as the, the, the swing vote here. Right. And if we can read into what his questions meant, doesn't seem too friendly to this. You know, I think, that, as you say, there were three days of arguments, six hours of argument, and it's, it's important to understand the average Supreme Court case lasts an hour. So this was six times longer than the average Supreme Court case. Uh, and there were certainly some comments from Justice Kennedy that I think ought to be a real concern to the administration. And they came at the beginning of the argument. As the argument went on, I think he sort of moderated and came back towards the middle. So I don't think it's so easy to, to predict. But as with so much else in the Supreme Court, I think the fate of this uh, lies in Justice, in Justice Kennedy's hands. Now, that doesn't mean it's necessarily a 5-4 opinion. There is, uh, I think if it loses, if the administration loses, if the mandate is struck down, um, it is likely to be by a 5-4 vote. I think the liberals on the Supreme Court will vote to uphold it. Um, if, um, if it is upheld, if the administration wins, which means Justice Kennedy sides with the Obama administration, it Chief is possible that the Chief Justice over? Roberts moves over and that it becomes a 6-3 vote. That's, you know, the same people, including me, who It's not just wishful thinking. Well, maybe, I, but, and, and there's no reason to, to, to believe anything I say because the same people who thought it was going to be an easy win are now, this is the new legal consensus, but we could be wrong again. Um, the one thing I think we can say with some degree of assurance is that this will almost certainly be decision announced in the last week of the term, which means the last week of, of June. Uh, and that is just as the campaign just as the is campaign is heating up, off. just as the conventions are, are are happening. So it is it is going to be a bombshell, I think, dropped in the middle of the and campaign. And not just this one, but the other case that even people who aren't court right. junkies have been watching, Arizona immigration. Right. Right. And there the issue, it's interesting because there is a legal issue that unites both of these cases. And the legal issue is what powers belong to the state and what powers belong to the to the federal government. Right? And immigration uh, was the purview of the federal government. And was immigration it not? has historically been the purview of the federal government. And you now have uh, states, uh, a handful of states across the country, but but led by Arizona 
who are frustrated by what they see as the federal government's inaction in addressing the immigration problem. They are largely, but not all. Arizona certainly is a border state. Um, and at some point, they said, if the federal government is not going to address this problem, we are going to address it. And Arizona passed its own law. And the critical provision of the Arizona law uh, that is before the Supreme Court is what has come to be known as the show me your papers uh, provision, which is a, a now a law in Arizona that says Arizona law enforcement officials, not immig federal immigration officers, Arizona law enforcement officials, if they have a reason to stop you, uh, meaning you didn't signal when you made a turn, you were speeding, your taillight was out, if they have a reason to stop you, and then the law says, and, Any they, ha reason. and they have a reason to believe that you may be an undocumented alien. In other words, you or I are not going to be asked for our you papers. You and I are not going to be asked for our papers. And, and the people who are are the people who are going to be, who are named, you know, Hernandez and, uh, and Gonzalez, or, or appear as though their names might be Hernandez and Gonzalez. And yet Justice Roberts, um, when he said to the Solicitor General, uh, this is not about racial profiling, the Solicitor General said, nope. No, it's not. Well, it's a trick. It's a trick lawyer's question, uh, and the reason it's a trick lawyer's question is that the actual legal issue before the court at the mm -hmm. end of April, when the case was argued, was does the state have the state of Arizona have the authority to pass immigration laws, or does that authority belong only to the federal government? It was a question of power that was presented to the Supreme Court. Um, but having said that, there are. Other challenges to um, that more expressly recognize what I think we all intuitively understand, and that is this law is an invitation to racial profiling. And, and this is the answer that I wish the Solicitor General had given, the fact that this is a law that invites racial profiling is yet another reason to uh, describe the law or to see the law as inconsistent with federal immigration policy because federal immigration policy is not supposed to be based on racial profiling. And that's why you want one entity, the federal government, setting immigra making immigration laws and not 50 different states with 50 you know, separate immigration regimes. So how does this then impact the presidential election? This also going to come out at the end of June. It impacts the presidential election in a different way, but, but in some ways perhaps even a more significant way, and that is that I don't think, I th it'll get intense press coverage when it's decided. I don't think the press coverage will, la will be as deep, will last as long as the coverage over the health care bill, but it is an issue of enormous importance to the Hispanic community. And the Hispanic community is the fastest growing demographic in this country. And it and has historically been split it has historically between been between both parties. But this could change that? Well, all of the polls show that um, Hispanics are moving toward the Democratic Party because of um, discontent with the Republican Party's immigration policy. What's going to be interesting, assuming that Mitt Romney gets the Republican nomination, is whether he starts to moderate his views as he moves from the primary season into the general election season because he started out in the primary appealing to the base of his party by endorsing the immigration law. And we already see Arizona's immigration law. We already see him beginning to back off. The other thing that I think is... is well, because because a primary is so different. Because a primary is so different a than a general election. election. The other thing that I think is very interesting is that is that whatever, even if the Supreme Court were to rule that Arizona had the authority to pass this law, we are already seeing buyer's remorse. And so the political system is is set three steps ahead of the Supreme Court on this issue, uh, because. Uh, businesses and farmers in places like Arizona and Alabama have decided that this is bad for business. Um, there's nobody to gather the crops, right? And they right. are now the pressure to repeal. We did it in New York. There wouldn't be any restaurants open. Right. There wouldn't be anybody cleaning your, your apartment. Right. So the pressure to repeal this now is really coming from agribusiness and big business mm -hmm. uh, as much as it is from, from the liberal and left community and the Hispanic community. And that's very interesting. So I even if the Supreme Court blesses this, is. I don't think you're going to see a lot more of these laws, and I think you're going to see some, some, uh, some you know, retrenchment moving back in places like Arizona and Alabama. So let's come closer to home. A uh, New Jersey case that didn't get as much um, ink as right. I might have thought that it would, and that is the blanket strip search right. out of Burlington County. And, Burlington and Essex. And, and, and tell us why 
um, this case mattered and why the uh, ruling, which has come down in this case, makes a difference. Well, here's what the court said in a sentence. The court says, if you're arrested and brought to a local jail, uh, no matter how minor your offense, traffic and traffic. traffic offense, and even if everybody understands you're going to be in that jail cell for two hours before you're sent home, everybody can be subject to a strip search. Um, it was a 5-4 decision. Uh, again, the majority opinion was written by the um, ever-present uh, Justice Kennedy. Uh, and I think what, um, what motivated him was his notion that jails are dangerous places. And if you're going to be locked up for no matter how long you're going to be locked up, um, the people running the jail have a right to be sure that you do not bring weapons or contraband into that jail so because it's that? a security threat. The answer is, 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 is there, are mo there are multiple answers to that. Um, one is there's been there's no evidence that people who are brought in for things like traffic offenses are bringing contraband or weapons into jails number one there's just no empirical evidence to support that um, number two well, presumably the, they don't know they're about to be arrested so so the, they're, they're they're not exactly they're not right and yeah. secondly uh, people who are um, brought in for two hours or three hours or four hours probably shouldn't be mixed with the general population in any event, in which case there's less of a security concern. And thirdly, we shouldn't be bringing people into jail uh, for minor traffic offenses. We should be giving them tickets and sending them home in the first place, in which case the security issue would, would never arise. Okay, now, so most yeah. of our viewers are in New Jersey. Right. So what does this now mean for New Jersey? What all does it mean right. for the rest of the country? What does it mean for us? So what the, all the, the Supreme Court didn't say that jails had to search, be, subject people to strip search. It just said the Constitution allows you to do it if that's what you choose to do. So in the, New Jersey? In New Jersey, you cannot do it as a matter of state law. There are, I forgot the number, but something like 16 states that, that prohibit it as a matter of state law. The federal government, if you're brought into a federal jail um, for short-term detention, immigration jails does not strip search so another people. another irony of, right. uh, of Supreme Court uh, of Supreme Court practice. Um, what are we looking at um, for this? What about FCC v. Fox? So now this is um, the indecency standard, right. and um, you know whether uh, what was that called? Uh, the wardrobe malfunction. The wardrobe right. malfunction and the expletive, the single right. word expletive. Whether having those. Um, terrible moments on television constitute um, cause for huge fines and penalties? Yeah, Th this is a fun case, you know, whether it's an enormously significant legal case, I, I, I don't know. But for many, many years... Except that it is silly at a time when most people are watching something other than broadcast television to have these very right. strict rules and then cable television can do whatever it wants. Right, it's, it's exactly right. We have very strict rules. Broadcast television has been treated as an animal unto itself. There are very strict rules and regulations that apply to broadcast television, do not apply to cable, do not apply if you watch even a broadcast show streamed on the internet only apply if you're sitting in front of your television watching NBC, CBS, ABC, or Fox television. And this That's at a time when the FCC's walked away from a lot of its other regulatory right. things that people like me in the television business liked. Right, right, yes. For example, the Fairness Doctrine. Exactly. Right. And, and so what has had, for years there's been a rule that can't, said you couldn't have pervasive vulgarity uh, on television and there were people who thought that that was silly and because we, we, the government ought not to be playing super nanny here, we ought to let parents supervise um, the television that their kids are watching and nobody draws distinctions anymore between what's a cable station and what's a broadcast station, you watch them all with the same remote um, on your couch and, and, and so to try to draw these lines between broadcast and cable So where is this going? You wouldn't no believe sense. we have two minutes left. Right. Uh, you know, I think the court is going to say that um, these fines were uh, 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 improper. I think they're going to strike down these fines. Okay, let's um, talk about next year because now we've right. got about 90 right. seconds. Two big race is the big race is the big issue next year. There, there. The court has already agreed to decide um, affirmative action in university admissions. The court several years ago. Didn't we think this was decided? We did think it was decided. It was a 5-4 case. Justice O'Connor was the fifth vote. She's now gone from the court. She's replaced by New Jersey's Justice Alito. Uh, we're not looking at Michigan's admissions program. We're looking at Texas admissions program. Um, 
there, a lot of people think that there's a real threat here that the court may, may undo some of what it did in Michigan a couple of years ago. And this, again, could come just before the presidential election, the argument, at least be talked, yes. The, the argument, argument, not the decision, will no, come right around the presidential election. Mm -hmm. um, there's also, there are cases queued up, the court hasn't yet taken them, on the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act. Big, big issue, the Voting Rights Act is the single most important and effective civil rights law this country has ever enacted, uh, and its future is now in real jeopardy. And there is some possibility that Prop 8, the same-sex marriage case from California, could find its way to the Supreme Court next year, too. We don't know that yet. So it's a hot season this time. Uh, it's been a hot term, and we can consider another one on our way next year. We'll be back next year, Sandy. Well, we certainly hope so. About a half hour right. is never long enough when Steve Shapiro is here. His incisive court countdown is an annual highlight, but don't wait for Steve and the next court season to come back to due process. We're here every week with public policy and justice issues that make it to the court and those that don't. For Ray Brown, who had this one off, and all of us here at Due Process, I'm Sandra King. See you next time. Another high-profile political issue that the court is also almost certain to announce the last week in June is a challenge to Arizona's infamous immigration law, the supposed, uh, the so-called show me your papers law. And the most controversial provision is a provision that says, if you were stopped by law enforcement officials in Arizona, lawfully stopped, they can interrogate you, they can arrest you, and they can detain you until they find out from the federal government whether you are here lawfully or not. And our view of this statute, among other things, um, is especially in, in Arizona with the infamous Sheriff Joe Arpaio, uh, this is an open invitation to racial profiling. even more insight on law and justice? Become a fan of Due Process on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and watch us on demand on YouTube.